This is Africa News Tonight on The Voice of America. Hello and welcome. Welcome to VOA Africa. Thank you for joining us. I'm Yehia Suhib in Washington. Here's what's coming up on Africa News Tonight. The question in a conflict such as this is that there's a moment for negotiations and for peace processes to start. And I'm not sure we've reached that moment. That's uh, Professor Roland Henwood, who lectures on politics at the University of Pretoria on the prospects that a group of six African leaders can nudge Russia and Ukraine to reach a peace deal. Details coming up also. Gunmen targeted a convoy of U.S. Embassy staffers in Nigeria. And the United Nations Humanitarian Response Plan is seeking $2.56 billion to help people affected by the Sudan crisis. These stories and more on African News Tonight. We start with our top story. The UN Special Representative to the Democratic Republic of Congo visits the scene of the flooding disaster in the east. Most, more than 500 people have died and thousands remain missing. Reporter Jafar al Katanti speaks with VOA's Douglas Mpuga about the visit and the disaster. The chief of MONUSCO, who is the representative of the UN General Secretary, visited the affected area in Kalehe, in Bususu village especially. And she came with a delegation of many representatives of UN, all UN agencies, because according to her, UN has to support uh, humanitarian services in this area as many people dead and all of them are killing me. How is the situation uh, in the areas that, that were visited by these UN officials? Uh, the s- situation is still very bad. Uh, I myself tried to, to walk around, but everywhere you can see that many bodies still underground because uh, local society doesn't have equipment to to discover bodies underground. And she also uh, see it because uh, she walked around a bit. And she said for that, MONUSCO will support the local community on how to, to remove all that soil and to see if they can find other bodies. And when we were there, local found a, a, a body which uh, was in a high level of the composition and they went to 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 bury it and also she said all UN agencies so the United Nations system um, will avoid three million dollars to support the response on this issue so uh, who else was in the delegation as far as you know all UN agencies I saw here there was WHO, WHP, OCHA, and UNICEF. Apart from the $3 million pledged and promising to exhume the bodies that might be still be there, what else did they promise to do to the not people only, there? Not only, to, not only to, to exhume the bodies, but also to, to buy some kits like medicines, food, because... Uh, these people first are isolated. There is nowhere from Bukavu to the affected way, uh, affected zone, and also no way from Goma to the affected zone. So they need food as their farms were destroyed. They need medicines. They need hospital. And they, as the government response was not enough, as the need is very big, so UN is about to support the government response with that 3 million USD. The United States government says it has placed visa restrictions on some Nigerians who tried to undermine their general elections in February and March. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said Monday that the United States is committed to supporting and advancing democracy in Nigeria and around the world. Blinken also said the U.S. government has taken steps to impose visa restrictions on specific individuals in Nigeria for undermining the democratic process during the country's 2023 election cycle. Joseph Olor Obari 
is a Port Harcourt-based attorney and public affairs analyst. He spoke with reporter Mike Mbonye about the visa restrictions. He says the U.S. decision is a step in the right direction and will serve as a deterrent to those who think they can undermine democratic process in Nigeria and get away with it. The decision by the United States government to impose visa restriction on individuals in Nigeria who were involved in intimidation of voters or issued threats or physical violence, inflicted physical violence on individuals during the last elections is a step in the right direction. I think that uh, this will serve as a deterrent to those who think that they are acting all on their own in this country and that it doesn't matter whatever result they get, it will send a message to them that the world is watching and that democracy means a lot to, to other countries like the United States and that they are willing to take steps to encourage the strengthening of democracy in Nigeria. There have been clamors and calls for, in, but I think it's not necessary to name those who are involved. Those who are involved were well-known people saw them. There were video evidence of people intimidating other people, causing violence, snatching ballot boxes, and all kinds of electoral crimes. These things are well-known to all Nigerians, to people. So the individuals themselves, when they go for visa or decide to travel out of this country, will get the result for what they have done. I don't think it's necessary for the United States government to name these individuals whom they have identified for their rules, their, their very negative rules in the last election. Do you think this measure will serve as a deterrent to other individuals in Africa not to undermine democratic process in their countries? As to whether this will be a deterrent to other individuals in African countries, who undermine democratic process, the steps are basically more persuasive than um, uh, you know, uh, the results are not immediately seen. But then, of course, it does go a long way to, uh, to, to change people's attitude to this kind of uh, behavior of intimidation, um, you know, disruption of election, perpetrating violence and all of that. In, in most other African countries, we've seen that these kind of behaviors have, have happened. It's happened in Kenya, in some other countries in Africa, where uh, individuals try to, to sabotage the democratic process. These steps that are being taken by countries like the United States is helpful in sending a strong message to African leaders that they must change their ways and actually promote inclusiveness in the elections. And the democracy must be what it is. It is meant to be participation by everybody, by the people, and their voices should be heard. What other measures should be applied to check individuals who undermine democratic process in their countries? Other measures that can be taken to discourage undermining democratic processes in African countries. It's just for countries, other countries in the world that are as prominent as the United States to take similar measures, to impose similar restrictions, to, to be persuasive enough to say they will not encourage leaders who are subverting democracy in their countries. But most importantly, I think there is need for countries like the United States to strengthen the democratic institutions in countries in Africa, like in Nigeria, such that the law can take its cause. And Nigerians who are committing crimes, electoral crimes, should be punished by the law. We should see that the courts are strong enough, they are independent, and they will be able to apply the law as it's written in their countries. So these steps will help a long, go a long way in helping African countries to strengthen their democracy. 
That was Joseph Olar Obari, a public affairs analyst, speaking with reporter Mike Mboni by phone from Port Harcourt, Nigeria. Authorities in north-central Nigeria are looking for gunmen accused of killing 29 people in a late-night attack. The resid- a resident told the Associated Press some attacks were still going on Tuesday evening in some places following the mass killings in three villages in Plateau State's Mangu area. Such attacks have become rampant in many parts of Nigeria's northern region. Plateau Governor Simon Bako Lalong described the attack as an attempt to return the state to the dark days of pain and agony. The office of South African President Cyril Ramaphosa says preparations are being made by a delegation of six African heads of state to visit Eastern Europe to discuss a plan to end the war in Ukraine. Russian President Vladimir Putin and Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky have agreed to separate meetings in Moscow and Kiev with the African leaders. Ramaphosa has not given a time frame or outlined any parameters for the potential peace talks. Darren Taylor reports. Ramaphosa said he'd be joined by the leaders of Egypt, Republic of Congo, Senegal, Uganda and Zambia, for what he called a peace mission to Eastern Europe. The US and the Europeans are going to view this proposal with some skepticism. Dr. Richard Gowan is the International Crisis Group's representative at the United Nations. He points out that four of the six African countries, Congo, Senegal, South Africa and Uganda, abstained from a United Nations vote last year condemning Russia's invasion. Zambia and Egypt voted in favor of the motion, but both have strong ties with Moscow. Gowan says the Ukrainians would be concerned that South Africa is leading the peace push. The African National Congress government has said it's neutral in the conflict, but it has also been accused of selling weapons and ammunition to Russia, which it denies, and South Africa's top army general met with his Russian counterpart in Moscow on Monday. The first task for the African Mediation Group will be to convince Kiev and Kiev's allies that this is a good faith initiative that could actually lead to a deal that would satisfy the Ukrainians. Zelensky has said he would not consider a peace deal to end the war until Russian forces withdraw completely from Ukrainian territory. Professor Roland Henwood lectures politics at the University of Pretoria. The question in a conflict such as this is that there's a moment for negotiations and for peace processes to start. And I'm not sure we've reached that moment. Um, Both leaders in Ukraine and Russia seem to be convinced that they can win this militarily. And that normally does not augur well for negotiations. He thinks something's happening behind the scenes to open the door for an African peace push. The challenge here for Ukraine is how long can they sustain what is happening? The country is being destroyed and they can get as much military aid as possible. They have a finite number of troops. They can only endure so much. Maybe Russia is in more difficulty than it seems. The sanctions definitely is having an effect. It may have a stronger effect than we think. Maybe the war is going worse than we think for Russia and they may be more amenable. Gowan says it's essential that any attempted peace process takes both Russia's and Ukraine's interests into account. The Ukrainians are very concerned that there will be a push for a ceasefire and that even if Russia did pause its hostilities, it would simply use that as an opportunity to firm up its control over the parts of Ukraine that it has... Oza said the US and Britain expressed cautious support for an African peace plan, but Henwood doubts they'd be involved too much as their Ukraine's major allies, and Moscow views them as enemies. For VOA News, I'm Darren Taylor in Johannesburg. You're listening to African News Tonight on The Voice of America. As fighting continues in Sudan, the United Nations Humanitarian Response Plan is seeking $2.56 billion to help people affected by the crisis, and the UN Refugee Agency is seeking more funding to assist those forced to flee. 
Ramesh Radha Singham, head of the UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs in Geneva and director of the Coordination Division, today said the team is seeking $2.56 billion. The conflict that uh, erupted on 15th of April last month in Sudan has killed hundreds of people, uh, injured more than 5,000 people, and millions more have been confined to their homes, unable to access basic services and essential health care, and nearly, and nearly placed many across to neighboring countries. Today, 25 million people, more than half the population of Sudan, need humanitarian aid and, and protection. This is the highest number we have ever seen in the country. The response plan we are launching today reflects that new reality. The United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees said the agency is seeking $472 million to assist more than 1 million people over the next six months. On April 15th, Sudan's army, led by General Abdel Fattah al-Burhan and the paramilitary rapid support forces, commanded by Mohammed Hamdan Dagalo, broke into open conflict. The two leaders, who had been leaders of the country's military government, disagreed over talks to create a transitional government, leading to civilian control. More than 1,000 shops in Tanzania's busiest market remained shut for a third day today as traders protested a new tax in a rare public demonstration against the government. The French news agency AFP says stores in Karyuku in the financial capital Dar es Salaam closed their doors Monday, calling for an end to multiple taxes, harassment by police and the tax collectors, and after the new levy came into effect last month. The closure of shops was prompted by the demand to register stores and pay the new store tax, one of the traders said during a meeting with Prime Minister Kasim Majaliliwa that was broadcast live on television. Majaliwa announced a moratorium on collection of the tax as well as the formation of a committee made up of government officials and traders. Gunmen targeted a convoy of U.S. Embassy staffers in southeast Nigeria yesterday, killing two of its Nigerian workers and two policemen. Police say the attackers opened fire on the convoy along a major road in Ogabaru, local government area in Anambra State, one of the epicenters of separatist violence in the region. We have reporter Mike Mboni in Port Harcourt again. He spoke with Ikenga Tochukwa, a deputy superintendent of police and spokesperson of Anambra State Police Command, about the attack. Well, currently, there is a joint security force operation going on there that has to do with police, military, and uh, even the vigilantes. We are not uh, leaving no stone on turn in this regard. We are also talking with the villagers to help us with uh, information. And I believe in due time we have uh, a positive uh, outcome of what uh, the operation that we have just embarked on. We will get back to the members of the public in that regard. For us, uh, the battle against these insurgents remains focused and sustained until security stability is fully restored in the state. Okay, PPRO, we also understand that uh, some persons were also kidnapped or abducted by the unknown government. Can you confirm that? And that's why I say there's a joint operation currently going ongoing now. Uh, it's since yesterday, and uh, in due time, we believe with the, uh, the way the operation is going, we believe that uh, something positive will come out of it. That was Ikenga Tochukwa, a deputy superintendent of police and spokesperson for the Anambra State Police Command. He spoke with journalist Mike Mbonye in Port Harcourt by phone. In Tunisia, the former head of parliament and leader of the Muslim Democratic Party in Ahada, Rashid Ganucci has been sentenced in absentia to one year in prison and fined 1,000 Tunisian dinars. He was charged with glorifying terrorism, and his family says he faces other charges as well. 
Reporter Elysia Volkman has more from Tunis. Rashid Ghanoushi's wife and lawyers learnt he had been convicted and sentenced when it was mentioned in a current affairs chat show late Monday night. Her daughter Samai Ghanoushi said that there was no official announcement, not even on the national news. Ghanoushi was arrested and detained one month ago, but since then has refused to cooperate with authorities or any judicial process and had instructed his lawyers to boycott the proceedings. We were completely shocked at the sentence itself, at the ridiculous charge my father is uh, has been a target of of, uh, of of extremists himself because of his uh, condemnation of uh, extremism and uh, defense of moderation and uh, democracy there was no actual trial when the lawyers arrived they were told that the verdict had already been issued um, uh, so the verdict was not actually read out in court as it's usually done. Rashid Ghanoushi, head of the Muslim Democratic Party in Ahta, is one of around 30 opposition politicians, judges and journalists who have been detained in recent months. All are charged with some form of conspiracy against state security. Ghanoushi's charge of glorifying terrorism is related to the video of a eulogy he gave last at a party member's funeral. A member of the police union filed the complaint all because of the word tyrant. Yusro Ghanoushi explains how saying this word has landed her father in prison. A common word with a clear meaning in Arabic, which is uh, tyranny or tyrant. Um, however, there is also <laughs> a uh, hijacking of this term uh, and use by uh, extremists against the police. So the security unions claim that my father was referring to them, but it is clear from uh, the context and the um, publicly available speech that he said that he was referring to tyrants in general. Rashid Ghanoushi's chief advisor, Ahmed Galul, told Voice of America that the case was possible because Tunisian President Kais Saied cracked down on the judiciary and dismissed 57 judges last year and brought the justice system under his control. Saad Sabil Cheli with Human Rights Watch says that the case is an abuse of the law. The conviction of Rashid Ranoushi to one year in prison is a new demonstration of the authorities' use of the anti-terrorism law to discredit and eradicate the opposition. Rights groups say President Syed has cracked down on opposition as the economy continues to weaken. The United States and European unions have expressed concern about efforts to silence the government's critics. For Voice of America Africa, I'm Elysia Falkman in Tunis, Tunisia. And the bodies of nine migrants from sub-Saharan African countries have been found in western Tunisia near the border with Algeria, according to an AFP report today. Tunisia, whose coastline is less than 150 kilometers, 90 miles from the Italian island of Lampedusa, has long been a favored stepping stone for migrants attempting the perilous sea journey from North Africa to Europe. AFP says the bodies were discovered in the mountains near Hydra, a town near the Kassadrin province, and authorities have launched an investigation that would include autopsies to determine the cause of death. The Tunisian Forum for Economic and Social Rights, a migrant support group, said in a statement the preliminary information points to cold, thirst, and fatigue as the causes of the migrants' deaths. Since the start of the year, dozens of migrants have drowned in a series of shipwrecks off Tunisia's shores while trying to reach Europe.